So I ended up going to a library to look up apprenticeship and literally applied to get into the iron workers knowing <laughs> nothing nothing about the career. I had no idea. And fortunately, because my name is Jamie, I got a letter in the mail not long after that was addressed to Mr. Jamie McMillan. I love that. All right. I do. It's uh, like, you know what? uh, It's the expectation. And um, I ended up having to go and do an aptitude aptitude test and a bunch of things. And I got accepted and started my apprenticeship. Now, the funny thing is, is they had given us a tool list. And I didn't know what any of the tools were because I still didn't know what an iron worker was. Tradesmen built America. Not policymakers or desk jockeys, but hardworking, blue collared men and women. Join me, Roger Wakefield, on conversations with some of the nation's most successful skilled laborers. This is the Trade Talks. What's one of the hardest things you ever had to do on a job site? I won't put it down to just one item. What I'll say is the hardest part of my career, I find, is that every single time I go to a new job site, I'm often working with new people and I'm learning new things. The learning new things part, I love. But the working with new people can be tough sometimes because you have to start all over again with proving yourself in that industry to those people. So it's like starting all over again every time. Each time you go to a new job. Each time you go to a new job site and you meet new people on that job, they don't know you. They may have heard about your reputation, but you're still, for the most part, starting new. And they want to test you and see what your work ethic is like. Especially as a as a like a underrepresented group, you tend to work harder to prove yourself every single time. What kind of reputation do you have? Because you said, if unless they've heard of your reputation... They're still going to test you every single time. I am very, I love my career and it shows when I do my job. I uh, I have a very good work ethic. I like to work hard. In fact, I kind of have an attitude where I like to show the guys sometimes that I can work just as good, if not better. So I do have a good reputation. And it's funny because I haven't been on the tools in a couple of years because I'm, I'm working, doing more advertising, advocacy, going into schools, educating. And I still run into people from the trades that still will run into me on the road or in a shopping center or something. And they'll be like, man, you're such a good worker. I've watched you work so many times. In fact, there's this one man, his name is Dave, and he was a carpenter and he would bring all of his guys at the mill over to the handrail when they were having a rough day. And he would say, you see that girl down there? Watch her work. If she can do that, I want to see you guys do that. So how long have you been in the trades? So I've been a member for 21 years of the iron workers and I've been with the boiler makers, I believe since 2017. A dual member in two different unions. Yes. So explain to everybody what an iron worker does and what a boiler maker does. Okay. So as an iron worker, we do a lot of structural maintenance, repairs. I'm not from a local that does a lot of the actual structural iron. So I've done a lot of my work in steel plants, uh, car plants, different hydro plants, mills. I've worked across Canada. I've worked on job sites out in the oil sands, uh, building and maintaining structures is basically what I do. So basically what I like to explain it as, and I use this illustration when I talk to kids, is if you think of the skeleton in your body, that skeleton holds you in the upright position. So I work on the structures of steel that hold buildings in the upright position. And a boilermaker is a little bit different. A boilermaker is very different. So we we work on uh, we can work on ships and vessels. A lot of boilermakers can work for the armed forces and in shipyards. But we also do a lot of work in steel plants. Uh, we have hydro plant work. We also work building the gas and oil plants because we'll build the vessels and the different structures. Now I haven't spent as much time with the boilermakers. I'm actually technically still a boilermaker apprentice. Tell everybody a little bit about you, who you are and what you do. So my name is Jamie McMillan and I have been an iron worker for 21 years and an apprentice boilermaker for a few years too. Haven't got close to finishing that apprenticeship yet because I'm also very passionate about skilled trades and I started advocating for the skilled trades as early as 2007 with an organization called Skills Ontario. Um, And I become, over the years, I've become somewhat of an educator. So I have an organization called Kick-Ass Careers named by students, Catholic school students. Mm. Um, And through that, I go and do multiple presentations throughout the school boards in Ontario. And then I also have a professional speaking brand um, and that's made in the trades. And through that brand, I have a lot of corporate audiences that reach out to me and I have an agent. Let's go back. You're, You're a welder, an iron worker, a boilermaker. 
not your typical, not your typical trades jobs, because those those are those are not quite as popular as plumber, electrician, HVAC technician. But not just that they're not typical trades job; they're definitely not typical trades jobs for women. No. How did you get into the trades? Very interesting story because. In high school, I really struggled. I was not an academic student. I was actually a bit of a, a troubled student. I did I excelled really well in creative programs and shop classes, but nobody told me about skilled trades being a pathway. So I became a high school dropout and went on a convoluted journey for a while. But eventually, interesting story, I'd moved 500 miles away from my hometown of Timmins, Ontario. That's where I'm originally from. And I moved down to Hamilton, Ontario. And I didn't know anyone in the city except for my roommate. And one day I was going to the grocery store with a very limited amount of money. I was struggling and sort of in a depression. And as I was walking to the store in this town of half a million people, a girl pulled over on the side of the road because she had to answer a call. It was actually a dispatch call. And when she pulled over, she went to write down some information and her pen ran out of ink. So she rolled down the window and asked the first person walking by if they had a pen she can borrow for a second. And I had a pen and I handed it to the girl. She wrote down this information and got out of the car and came over onto the, the sidewalk to talk to me. And she says, your name is Jamie. And I'm looking at this girl and I don't recognize her at all. And she started telling me that she had gone to school with me in Timmins, Ontario. Wow. And she asked me how I was doing. Of course I lied because actually this was my high school enemy. (laughs) Ah. Yeah. Very interesting plot twist. Uh, So she was my high school enemy. She asked me how I was doing and I lied and I made it sound like my life was great because I don't want to tell my old enemy about, you know, having this, I was very discouraged. And uh, she told me she was an iron worker. And I had no idea what she was talking about, but she was talking about, you know, look at that bridge. I learned how to weld there. I built that factory. I make a hundred thousand dollars a year. I have no mortgage. Um, you know, I bought this brand new car. She looked great, beautiful tan, nice muscles, great hair, designer clothes, three thousand dollar purse. I'm like, wow. And what's an iron worker do? Yeah. <laughs> so I and I didn't know what she did. No, I like that. So back then I, I I was very late to the internet stuff. So I ended up going to a library to look up apprenticeship and literally applied to get into the iron workers knowing <laughs> nothing, nothing about the career. I had no idea. And fortunately, because my name is Jamie, I got a letter in the mail not long after that was addressed to Mr. Jamie McMillan. I love that. All right. And I do. It's like, you know what? It's the expectation. And um, I ended up having to go and do an aptitude, aptitude test and a bunch of things. And I got accepted and started my apprenticeship. Now, the funny thing is, is they had given us a tool list. And I didn't know what any of the tools were because I still didn't know what an iron worker was. I went to, we have a, a hardware store in Canada called Canadian Tire. And I went to Canadian Tire to get my tools. And one of the tools was a spud wrench. And it was funny because the guy at the Canadian Tire, this young man that was serving me, he goes, are you a potato farmer or something? Because of spuds. Absolutely. Um, and that's how I started. I showed up to work on the first day. I had the wrong tools, the wrong kind of hard hat. I, I didn't, I had very little knowledge of what I was getting into and quickly ended up loving every minute of it. And you said you weren't a good student. You flunked out of school. That's right. But you still passed an aptitude test. I did study up some math real quick, but the aptitude test is an interesting test because it more or less tests is like mechanical abilities. You know, there'll be like gears and different designs of stuff. This wheel's turning this way and it's touching this one, which way will, no, I get it. Yeah. You've got to think. Okay. Yeah. If this cog is turning this way and this cog's connected to it, it's going to turn that way. And if there's one up here, that's going to turn the other way. And and look, I love those tests. That Yeah, that's what it was. I excel at those because it's it's like the way my mind works. Yep. You did not even know what an iron worker was, but you were applying to become an apprentice. You got a tool list. You had no idea what anything was. I have people reach out to me every day about getting in the trays and they say, I don't know anything about plumbing. I could never do it. How wrong are they? They're very wrong. If you have that type of mechanical mind and you can pass that aptitude test, 
you can do anything in the skilled trades because to be honest, everything in the skilled trades is all transferable skills from one trade to the next. I mean, people are like, oh, I can't be in the skilled trades. I'm like, but you want to be a doctor? You're going to work with the same kind of tools. Absolutely. Maybe not the same type. I don't think they'll ever use a pie wrench. Okay. But no. you know. No, but like saws. No, no, no. I, 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 I was definitely playing. So how long from the time you got in did it take you to realize I'm going to love this. So the first job that I went on to was interesting because they put me in a confined space situation and I was the confined space attendant. And this was only about a okay, two so, week so, shutdown. So, so, but before you go on any further, there's a confined space supervisor, attendant, and entrant. Yes. So you weren't the one in the confined space. You're the one making sure, hey, I've got my eye on him, her, whoever's in there. They're good. We've got a retrieval plan in place, whatever it is. It's a good job to start out. It's like, okay, you learn, you're taking information from the supervisor. You're also conveying information to the entrant and you're the one monitoring CO2, high level explosives, low level explosives, everything for confined space. Yes. Yeah. So you have a lot of responsibility on you. It's a a boring job to sit there all day, but you, you have the responsibility of making sure that every one of those people entering that space are coming in and out safely. I was on a confined space watch job. That was my very first job and it was night shift. And there was another girl on the job. She, they had pulled her over from another position and they put us on the confined space. And at the end of the day, every day, they would ask the male apprentices at the other confined space to go down and clean out the flume and help the guys clean up, but they never asked the girls. And I actually was frustrated in the beginning because I have ADHD. I have a hard time sitting still. I wanted to get in. I wanted to build and do things with my hands. That's what I thought this career would be. And now I'm sitting here for a 12 hour shift. And I was like, this is frustrating. Looking at a piece of paper. So my superintendent actually came over to talk to me the one day before this job was going to wrap up. This is probably about 10 days in on a 14 day turnaround. And I'll never forget, we sat there and we had this conversation and I, I had blonde hair and I had like these braids coming down and I had been a bartender first. So I, you know, I'm just a very friendly social person. We're ch- chit chatting. And he ended up telling me that I was never going to make it as an iron worker because it was really tough work and I was too pretty. So the general foreman had come to sit with me after the superintendent left and I was upset. And I told the general foreman, I said, I'm really upset with the supervisor. He thinks I don't have what it takes to make it in this industry. And he doesn't know me. Mm -hmm. And that really ticks me off. I guess he turned around, told the superintendent. So the next night, the superintendent came up to me before the end of the shift and he says, so you think you have what it takes to be an iron worker? I said, I sure do, sir. So he says, okay, well, I'm going to send you down in the flume instead of sending both of the guys down, you can go down with one of them. And he goes, you're going to go clean it out. Well, I took the advantage of that. I went down there and I was, oh yeah, I was rolling up those cables, throwing chain falls over, bringing them up, laying them in the coffin box, up and down the stairs. I've had that place sparkling. (laughs) I don't think it had ever been that clean. And uh, yeah, because I did that and I showed initiative, that supervisor ended up taking me over to another job. They transferred me to uh, the blast furnace where I spent the next 15 months learning on the blast furnace and it was a, such an epic experience you have to show initiative yeah, no, you, you do and, and, and i think that's a great way to do it and i like the way you did it it's just look i can do this and, I, and i'm upset that you think i can't have you found anything you couldn't do in the trades no i found things that have frustrated me but for the most part i believe that you if you want to do something, you do it wholeheartedly. And I will, I will fight tooth and nail to learn how to do things. And then when I learn how to do them, I want to excel at them. I want to prove that I could do it just as good, if not better than everyone else. Like that's, to me, that's my drive. Now you started out in the union. I worked 17 years open shop before I got in the union. And of course, when you get in the union from open shop, you're a rat, you're dumb, you're stupid. You don't know anything. You didn't learn how to plumb. You just plumb. So I made it my goal to try to outperform them each and every day because I learned from some great plumbers. But the neat thing that that I think you said that, God, I want everybody who listens to this to hear it is I knew nothing about this. Didn't know what they did. I just knew I was applying to be one. Yep. And didn't know anything about any of the tools, but I was out buying them. Got some wrong tools, got the wrong hard hat. But now you're probably one of the most popular iron workers 
I'm going to say in Canada, but, but maybe the world, because you, you talk about this on social media all the time about what you do, why it's such a great, and I want to say profession, but, but I'm talking all the trades. It, it's, it's a great career choice. Yes. For anybody. If you have the mechanical ability to work with your hands and learn, you can do this. Did you know before you got in the trades that you really had the ability to work with your hands well? Interestingly, my father is a miner and I come from a long line of skilled trades professionals on my father's side. My mother happened to be a nurse, um, but her brothers were all welding and working in mines. So I have a lot of skilled trades experience. And the great thing about my parents is even though my mom was a nurse, my parents were both workaholics and they loved buying and fixing up places. So my whole life, I was my dad's oldest of three girls. I was like his little boy. My dad was constantly teaching me how to do things around the house. I mean, I remember they, they would, you know, do drywall and help teach me. I still can't do mudding and taping, but I, I learned, I learned a lot of things around the house from my dad and we lived in a neighborhood full of boys. So my dad used to like to teach me how to do stuff to show off to the boys that I could do it better. Mm -hmm. So I could swing a hammer by the time I was eight, like most men. You you make me think of, of one of my granddaughters. She wanted to play, wanted to get better at basketball. So I signed her up for a camp with the Dallas Mavericks. I remember the camp she went to, Spud Webb was there, and he's like five foot two, five foot four, did amazing in the NBA. And I take her that first day and I hang around for a little bit and I've got to come back to work. So I said, look, I'll I'll be back to pick you up. She's like, okay. And they had her in the, the younger room where most of the girls were. And I came back to pick her up and got through a little early. And she's over in the other room, the older room. And she's one of one or two girls. And I'm watching and they're playing and like, okay, she's doing good. And kind of sat back, watched, let them all finish, let the coach talk to them. And we go out to the truck and we're, we're headed home. I headed back over here because I think she stayed with me that week. And I remember asking her, I said, so did you have fun today? And man, just ear to ear smile. It's like, yeah. I said, what did you learn today? She said, I learned that I can play with the boys. And I can do good. I mean, I've, I've talked to you for a long time. I'm an advocate for women in the trades. We, there's a million unfilled trades jobs in the United States right now. A million. Every year in the United States, for every 10 people that retire, there's only three or four getting in the trades. The people coming into the trades today are going to be the entrepreneurs in five or 10 years. What would you tell somebody that, and and I'm going to even go go deep, that didn't do well in school, had a hard time in school, struggled through school. I, I stayed in trouble during school, stayed in trouble. Okay. That's where I lived. It was just, it's the way it was. And I knew if I got paddled at school, I was going to come home get paddled at home too. It's like, (laughs) if you get licks at school, you're going to get them at home too. So it's like, like, man, that's double trouble. But you know, I still ended up there. (laughs) What would you tell some troubled kid? What would you tell them if they're like, look, I'm, I'm nothing but trouble. I'm not going to go to college. I'm never going to amount to anything. The, the interesting thing that you're talking about getting in trouble in school is I got in trouble in school a lot too. And I think that's because the school system is kind of backwards. The school system was really created for academics. It was never, you know, pro, the programs never were helpful for people who just couldn't sit still, sit in a classroom and listen to lectures. But people with mechanical skills, like we were the bad crowd in school because we did skip class. We were bored in class. We didn't want to sit there. So we couldn't listen. We didn't have the attention to listen. I don't think we were the bad crowd. I think we were the bored crowd. That's what I really believe. And I think that if many of us had known that skilled trades pathways did exist, I think some of us wouldn't have ended up in the situations that we ended up in. And in fact, I feel like a lot of at-risk youth just weren't raised properly to know that this is an option because I believe that everybody has what it takes in them to do something, to be successful at something. When you think about infrastructure, it is everywhere in the world. I think people minimize how 
huge this industry is. And there are so many people that would be suited to this industry. So people who don't think they can do this, I really want to encourage them to get out to places where they can try hands on things. Maybe at home they do arts and crafts. Maybe they've never tried something. Just go buy a birdhouse kit, do something and see if you have the ability to do that. The only thing that's very important in skilled trades that some people struggle with, including myself, and I don't know about you, is math. We do have to have math skills. And in most trades, they want you to have a minimum of a grade 10 and some up to grade 12. So go hone in on those math skills. If that is a problem for you, I don't get a tutor, get anything. But I will tell you that once you start doing things and apply that math to it, when you're building with your hands, you're applying it. Yeah, it's like the bells and whistles go off. So I always tell people, if you struggle in school with math, the most important thing you should do is go and take a tech ed program because it's going to open your mind to math. Now you say tech ed. If somebody wants to get out and get in the trades, how do they do that? If somebody wanted to get out and become a plumber, because that's probably a lot different than getting out and becoming an iron worker or a boiler maker. If somebody wanted to get out of high school or somebody just graduated, and they're like, I want to be a plumber. I don't want to go to university, college, uni, what, what, whatever we're talking about. How do they do it in Canada? Well, there are some great opportunities in Canada. So it's particularly in Ontario, and I know we have programs like this all across Canada. They have coordinators that are starting to educate students as young. They have me working with up to pre, like from pre-kindergarten up. So we have in Ontario, we have the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Coordinators that are specifically promoting skilled trades in schools two kids and you can start doing your apprenticeship hours while you're still in high school. When you go into grade 11, you can start doing co-ops, leaving the school through the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program. And a lot of these students get hired from their co-ops or, you know, it's word of mouth. They'll like one co-op will say, well, I can't hire right now because I want to keep my program open for co-op students, but then they'll pass your name off to another employer and you can literally get registered immediately as an apprentice and start working right out of high school. Like these kids are starting at 17, 18, you know, it's, it's amazing. If you get past high school and you still haven't gotten an apprenticeship, hopefully you took some of those shop classes. That's going to help you with that, you know, that experience that they want you to have. And they care more about attitude than skills because they can teach skills. If you get past that point, now you, we do have college programs. So we have all kinds of amazing college programs and tech colleges up in Canada as well. So you can go take tech exploration programs that'll help you figure out what trade you want to be in. It's a whole program for a year or two where you're trying out different trades. We have a lot of pre-apprenticeship programs that are government funded through different organizations like the YWCA has some for women. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we have a lot of different programs like that. Other than that, I tell people, if you are passionate about doing this, go pound on the pavement, go bring resumes, go be that squeaky wheel. You'll eventually get grease, just knock at doors. I mean, I have a friend, Elvira, who's part of our crew at Kick-Ass Careers, and she couldn't get a job. And she really wanted one. She volunteered on a job site for a week. She went up to an employer and said, I'm going to work for you for a week. If at the end of the week, you don't think I qualify, fine. I'll just, I'll walk away. But if you think that I do a good job, you owe me an apprenticeship. And they kept her. That's ballsy. Yes. Yeah, she's ballsy. That's pretty cool. (laughs) You said something a while ago about a superintendent bringing his guys over to the rail and pointing down at you and saying, look. Yes. Do what she does. I would think as a woman, you've got to outperform to not be labeled just a woman. Is an open shop plumber coming in the union, same thing. It, it's like, you're the dumbest guy on the job site. Yes. Like, okay, y'all, y'all hold my beer and watch this. <laughs> How do you become a great tradesman? I think it's just, especially if you have the passion to do this, you're going to want to do it well anyways. How do you do it? You show up on time every day. You have a good attitude. It's, it's always going to stem back to your attitude. Skills can be developed as you're learning, but be open-minded, ask questions. I know, you know, sometimes we feel 
like we can to ask questions. We think they're dumb questions. There's no dumb questions. Just ask and pound that pavement and do the best that you can. I mean, there's been jobs that I've been on and they've explained something to me and I'm still scratching my head and they walk away and I can't figure it out. But I'm going to keep asking questions until I can figure it out. And then a lot of times when you do figure it out, it's like, oh, the lights go on, right? And you're like, mm-hmm. oh, this. And then from there, you just, it's interesting because somebody can show you how to do something. And I swear to God, my first foreman, I think he always showed me the toughest way to do something because he wanted to see if I would have the ability to learn. And one thing I have to say that I learned really early on in the trades is go find the oldest person, the oldest person in the industry. You know, sometimes people are afraid to talk to those old, old school guys. Is that They're why you're the here best. with me? Is that why you're here with me? <laughs> yeah, that's why, Roger. <laughs> you're right, though. But- Yeah. Go find the oldest guy. They have the tricks of the trades. And the worst thing about the trades is that we're losing that old talent. All those older people are now retiring. When they're gone, you know how many years of experience and knowledge we're going to lose with them if we don't capitalize on this right now? So those are the, they're the best people. And that's what I did. I just never stopped. I actually brought my son in here, Randy, and interviewed him just like I'm doing you. And Randy said the same thing. He said that, you know, because I got or helped get him into the union. He said that anytime he went on a job and the, the superintendent showing him around, he'd always find the oldest welder there or somebody and say, hey, I want to work with him. And he'd look at him and say, like, no, you don't. Nobody wants to work with him. He said, no, trust me, I do. Yep. And that's why. He's like, they want to teach you, but they want somebody that's willing to learn. Yes. Not somebody that's going to say, yeah, they taught us another way. Don't worry about that. It's like, dude, you show some respect to the old guys and let them know, look, I want to be good. I'm not good right now. I'll tell you that. I'm going to screw up. I'm going to mess up. And man, they will take you under their wing. Somebody else can talk trash about you. and be like, hey, that's my boy. You better stop. I know tricks and, and tips and success leaves clues. And we get good at doing a lot of things. And if nobody ever asks us, how'd you do that? Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to have to struggle to figure it out. And it may take two, three, five, 10 years for them to figure out what, hey, it took me two, three, five, 10 years, but now I can teach it to you and you can get good at it in a month or two. What's the neatest thing you learned from an old guy? The older guys are always the best and people are intimidated by them. They're like, oh, he's the crusty old guy oh, on yeah. site. No, but he's mean. Nobody wants to work with him. I know. And the funniest okay. thing too, is that people sometimes think that the older crew are actually more against having women on the site. That's not true. Sometimes they don't talk to you because they don't know how to approach you. you um, and then when you talk to them and you prove that you're really there and you want to learn from them, oh man, they take you under your wing. Um, I've learned so many different tricks from the older guys, but something that I really learned is that there's just different ways of working in the industry and different ways of picking things up. So it's a heavy industry to work in. Mm -hmm. And I remember I used to sometimes be at the end of a shutdown, going around collecting bottle carts and rolling and spinning the big, you know, oxygen bottles and stuff around. And you roll like two at a time and... I was, I was, I I was trying to get really good at that, but it's, it's awesome because just the littlest things that you struggle with, like picking up those bottle carts and throwing them in the truck. And then some old guy will run over and say, Hey honey, you're going to hurt your back like that. And, and they show you, and all of a sudden that cart that weighs 50 pounds feels like it weighs 10 pounds the way they teach you how to lift Mm it. And, and learning little tricks and tips like that over the years has actually saved me from injuries and that wear and tear on my body. And it's, it's sometimes it's things that you wouldn't even think to do in, on your own. Like you wouldn't think it would work that way. And it works out really well. You said the old guy comes over and says, Hey honey. Yes. Does that bother you? No, because I, I've learned really quickly how to recognize conscious and unconscious bias. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think of my dad in situations like this, my dad, you know, he always calls everyone like Han or, you know, he's you got that pet name and that's kind of an old school thing. Everybody used to do that. It was a polite thing to do. It's respectful. It's not bad. Yes. So it depends. I mean, you know, it depends on who's coming and how they're approaching, the tone of their voice, the the body, like, you know, so no, a lot of the elderly men that I got to work with on the job site, a lot of them would be retired and they would come back and they'd be placed with me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they, they, the sweetie and hun, and I don't mind that at all. What should women know to help them not let it bother them as much? What should men know to understand why it does? 
I think it's trying to recognize that conscious versus unconscious bias. Are they doing it because they're trying to belittle you or is it because they're, you know, trying to, you know, come on to you? There's a whole bunch of different reasons why people would do that. And I think that when you think of the older school people, they all spoke like that. Maybe it was my upbringing too, because I'm used to seeing that my, my father spoke to that, but it's the way they're approaching you as well. You know, I've, I've, noticed a lot of times in a construction site, if I'm the only girl, I don't want to stand out like a beacon. I'll never dress in a way that you will recognize that I'm a girl. I kind of dress in baggy coveralls. Like me wearing a pink shirt in this morning when I came in. Yes. 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 And, so, and I did that. I was going to see if you'd say anything. Yeah. I didn't say anything. Actually, it was, it was a great shirt. So yeah, it, it looks uh, good on me. I, I wear it well. Yes, you do. But I'm not the kind of person that wants to be a beacon on a job site. I don't want to stand out as a girl because I believe that on the job site, I want to be recognized as a skilled trades professional. I'm not a girl. I don't identify as anything on the job site except for a skilled professional. And now I can't remember the point of this question. <laughs> what do women need to know to understand about yeah. men calling them honey or baby or whatever? And what do men need to know why it does there are some people that are offended by it. Yes. And it doesn't matter if, if you know me, you, you know how I feel about women on the trades. Yep. There's someone, if I say, hey, honey, will you grab that? They're going to be like, I ain't grabbing nothing. Yep. You understand. Nope. It, it's a sign of respect. You're being nice. Yep. I wish more women understood that. But then again, I think you're right. A lot of guys are like, hey, honey, how are you? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you know what? You just made my skin crawl. You're good. What's the biggest problem you've ever had on the job being a female? I think being a female is that, yes, you're always put back into that, you know, oh, this is just a girl on the job site. They don't know why you're actually there. Sometimes they think you're there for the wrong reasons and you're not actually there to work. People are like, oh, you're just here to pick up a man or, you know, different things like that. Um, but I think the biggest, some of the biggest problems I've had on the job site is that I I'm a person who, and this has a lot to do with my ADHD because people with ADHD tend to have a little bit of a emotional dysregulation and we have something called rejection sensitivity dysphoria. That's what's wrong with me, y'all. <laughs> but it, it's true. And I think that my biggest issue over the years, people keep telling me all the time, Jamie, don't think, don't take things so personally. And I had a really hard time for the longest time not taking things personally and then going home at night and ruminating about it because somebody might have said something to me and I took it in the wrong way and I ruminated on it and then I thought they didn't like me. And then it just became this, I noticed that I had a cycle. And, and then if I thought somebody didn't like me, I, I tried to avoid them. And I kind of did that to myself by separating myself from people. And I think that that caused problems for me in the industry. Now, when I reflect back on it, because now later on in life, I'm starting to understand what that ADHD actually does to people. So if you're a person who has ADHD, please look it up and figure out that a lot of those things and those emotions that you don't know how to deal with, if you're going home and ruminating about something and that's causing problems for you and you're losing sleep at night over it, mm -hmm. it might just be part of your diagnosis. And that was the hardest part for me in this industry was to get over those sometimes comments that would come my way and I would ruminate them on, on them. How would you get over them? Eventually oh. tell yourself, look, it, it, it wasn't personal. Or do you confront them? Do you, how, how do you handle it? It took years for me to figure out how to separate myself from it. And how do I handle it now? Now it's like, whatever. Right. I'm just here to do my job. Just put me to work. My thought is, it's social media. You know, I have people go out here and tell me every day, I suck. I'm stupid. I should never be making videos. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm doing. And I just reply back, you know, you jumped in my social platform to hate on me. And I'm making stuff because I'm trying to make people better. Yes. You keep doing you, hater, and I'm going to do me. Yes. Even I've had some come in and argue. It's like, what have you done to help anybody lately? Tell me. Because I've made 2,000 videos to try to help people. Yes. What have you done? And normally that's where the conversation ends. Some people are hating because. They're never going to be as good as you. Jamie, I'll never be able to weld like that. So you suck. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just, that's their mindset. Yeah. You know, if I can't do better than you, I'm just going to tell you how horrible you are. Yeah. What made you start doing social media? 
Social media is a way to extend what you're doing, the positive changes you're making, and put that out online to reach a broader audience, in my, in my opinion. So if I'm going into a school and I'm talking to students and then I'm posting about it on social media, then that it's interesting because a lot of times those students are going home and they're telling their parents. And I've had so many parents reach out to me on social media after and be like, oh, that's my daughter in your picture. Or that's my son dressed up in your Not presentation. The and then they get in touch with me and they stay in touch with me. And it's so funny because I've actually ended up watching parents who didn't even have interest in the skilled trades all of a sudden reaching out to me to say, my kid came home so excited. I didn't even know these were career pathways. And then they're reaching out to me to ask me about these career pathways for themselves. Mm -hmm. Did you do social media first or did you start talking and speaking to kids first? I started talking and speaking to kids first. I started uh, doing presentations, well, not presentations. I started as a mentor with Skills Ontario. I don't know if it was 2006 or 2007 when they reached out to me in email and I had no idea who they were. I didn't, don't even know how they got in touch with me. But they started inviting me to mentorship events where I would sit at a table over a lunch or a dinner with a bunch of students and just talk about being in the trades. And then one day a panelist didn't show up and they asked me to jump in for this panelist. And I, I remember I was, I, I nearly pooped my pants. I'm not going to lie. I was so scared to get up on stage. Um, but they put me on the stage. And after that, teachers started reaching out and said, you have a really cool story. Will you come out and talk here and there and everywhere? And as I started to pick up and speak more and more at events, that's when I started to post it on social media. And then that, following started. And then that's when I ended up, uh, creating like a Facebook page and, you know, really started advocating. And that's, then I came up with a brand. Kick-ass careers. Yeah. <laughs> tell me about it. Oh, it makes me so proud. So I, uh, I can tell. Yes. Immediately. Well, yeah. I know I'm glowing. <laughs> uh -huh. Um, when I started kick-ass careers, basically, um, I, I used to just say journeyman because I'm a journeyman iron worker. Some people don't like that word. I see it as a status, not a gender. Absolutely. You know, so I'm proud of the word journeyman. I don't want it to be journey person or anything. I am dang proud of this. You know, somebody, uh, we were writing an introduction to a video, a, a script, uh, to something. And one of my people put journeyman and journey women. And I said, no, it's, it's journeyman. I said, yeah, but there's women too. I said, I understand that. And you're exactly what I thought of. Look, they want to be a journeyman. Yep. They don't want to be a journey woman. They don't want to be a journey person. They want to be a journeyman, just like every other person in the trades does. So I do. I love that. And the first time I heard you say that, it, it stuck with me because I'm arguing my guys. It's like, no, we're not saying that. I'm taking that out. And they're like, okay. I understand they're going to switch it for political reasons because, you know, everybody's about, you know, gender equality and being recognized mm -hmm. as equals, which I, I believe. I just love it because it's like we're human. We're mankind. You know, you we're journeymen. I, I don't know about in the U.S., but in Canada, you can get a bachelor degree. It's not a bachelorette degree. It's a bachelor degree. I got a bachelor degree, but my bachelor degree, degree is called a journeyman. I worked mm -hmm. hard for that status and I'm, I'm proud of that status. So like that. that's, that's the way I see it. You know, anyways, I started out with the journeyman. It's a status, not a gender. And then eventually I decided I wanted to focus more on everyone and I wanted bold and engaging presentations. And I just put it out there and I was up in a place called Fenelon Falls working on a one week tour with a bunch of schools. And we went out, we had some tech teachers and some students and we went and sat down at a restaurant over lunch and we just started talking and we came up with a few different ideas and then kick-ass careers just like, boom there it was. And some students gave me ideas for a logo. And I brought that to somebody who actually came up with the design for the logo. And it just went from there. And I started, it was really cool. Cause when you go to a high school, you know, and they say kick ass courage is here for a presentation. Now the kids are intrigued. Right. Before it was like Jamie McMillan from journeyman is here. And the kids are like, huh, I'm going to skip. Yeah. Right. But now it's like kick-ass careers are like, Ooh, what are these careers about? And then they come down to the gym and lo and behold, I'm talking about skilled trades and it's intriguing for them. You have to have something bold and engaging to attract people to this industry. And you bring your welding hood with you too. I do. Actually, I bring about six different outfits of, of outfits that I've worn in the trades over the years. Um, and I dress kids up. So when I get to the schools, I'll ask, if I can get a volunteer working crew 
And I'll ask sometimes for some of the class clowns and some of the underdogs. I ask for boys, girls. I want a lot of diversity. And then I get them up on the stage with me as I'm talking. So I do my presentation and each of those students is representing either a different career or a different level of their career. So because the students are part of my presentation, it makes my presentations more engaging to the other students because kids got to see it to be it. And now they're seeing kids dressed up as construction workers, their peers, their friends, and and it just has a whole different way of engaging them. It's really cool. Tell me about your coloring books. (gasps) Oh, that's so cool. So (laughs) thank you. A few years back, well, several years back, people kept telling me, Jamie, you know, you're getting more and more popular in this space for speaking. Did you know if you ever want to become a professional speaker, you should do a book? Now, I'm not the person who's going to sit down and write a book. I have a hard time sitting down and write an article, never mind a whole book. So I contacted Pat Williams, who's my business partner down here in the state. She's a retired stationary operating engineer in LA. And I told her, you know, people are bugging me to do this book, but I, I talked to kids. And she said, you know, Trade Women Oregon, Trades Women Oregon, I believe it was, years ago had done this book back in the 70s. And she said, let me reach out to them and see if they would mind. Maybe you can do a coloring book. So she reached out to them because we don't want to do anything that other people have done or doing without their permission. We're not going to piggyback or copycat or capitalize on other things. We want to think outside the box. So she got in touch with them and they were like, yeah, go for it. Um, So we decided that we were just going to make this really cool coloring book series. So it's Pat Williams and myself. And then she has a friend who's also a millwright and stationary operating engineer himself. And he's an artist. And so he decided to come up, we brainstormed, we came up with a concept and then Finn just kind of jumped in and took over and he came up with the art and we created this coloring book series. So now we have our first and second edition are out, all the kids on Builder Street. And then our second edition is all the kids on Builder Street at Skilled Trades Avenue. So we're doing intersections on this street now. And each of the kids in the coloring book knows somebody that's in the trades, whether it's their aunt, their uncle, their brother, their sister, their their grandparent, their step sister. And we try to make it super diverse. And because they know everything about the trades, they know how everything is made. What's the biggest thing that these kids get when you come in and speak to them at school? What's their big takeaway? What do they come up and tell you? Oh my gosh. I can't, I I, I can't even put it into words because it's just such an emotional thing. I've seen kids that you know, they, they, they never even thought they had the ability to do something. And then I go in and I speak to them. And I think for some of these kids too, depending on what their background is, the families they come from, there's a lot of really poor students. I go into some schools that they don't have money. They don't shop classes. They don't see hope for their future. And then I start talking to them about, did you know that you can get paid to go to school building things with your hands and that college and university isn't the only pathway. And then we'll do hands-on skills. I mean, I just did this tour recently where I spent two weeks on the road and we were doing with this one school board, we were building birdhouses with kids in grade one, two, and three. And these kids were building these stuff and you can see it, it was like light shows in their eyes. Like they were just sparkling. And some of those kids, I walked up to them and they said, I had no idea I could build things with my hands. And it just opens up their mind when they're still in elementary school. And now it's like, now that you know you can do this, when you get to high school, you make sure you take advantage of all those tech programs. Because not only, I think tech programs should be mandatory in school, they should be compulsory. Because when you think about our education system right now, it is not meant for today's day and age. Everybody's going to drive a car. If people took auto class in school, they would know the basics of maintaining a car. It would take away some of this road rage people have, you know, because they know to move their car to the side of the road or they can fix a flat tire and not wait three hours for, you know, a tow truck to Mm -hmm. come along. Um, And everybody's probably going to have their own home taking a basic construction class, learning how to do those things. And then I tell the kids, now that you know you can do that, make sure you take those tech classes. And if you don't get into trades, you have practical life skills that are going to save you thousands of dollars yes and they're going to make you feel empowered to do the things that you can do on your own around your house whether it's renovations switching out a light fixture but if you are really good at it and excel at it voila the world is your oyster because when you get into the skilled trades you can take that career anywhere in the world 
That's one of the cool things about skilled trades. You can take it anywhere. Everybody needs infrastructure. So when you tell them about this, it's, yeah, it's mind blowing. It's like a big supernova. So what's the neatest story you've ever heard from one of the kids after your presentation? I met Dee. She was in grade 12 in a high school shop class. She was in the class as the only girl. And I ended up running this cool little contest with the kids that year. So they were all building Muskoka chairs to sell to the community. We were doing advertising. So I went into the school to talk and this girl D says, you know, she comes up to me and she's kind of shy and starstruck because sometimes they think the speaker is something special. And I it's like, get you it. know, yeah. I get it. So I said to her, I said, D, here's my phone number. If the guys in this class ever give you any issues, you call me, you text me, you do whatever. Well, she didn't want to. She's really shy. And then her teacher finally said to her, Mr. Q, he says, D, she gave you her number. Just reach out. So when I get a text message, I have the afternoon off. I'm sitting at home. I get a text message. Bing. It's like, hi. <laughs> message her. What's up? She's like, the guys are being jerks in the class today. I'll be there in 25 minutes. And she lives about 25 minutes away in the next town over. Well, I jumped in my truck and I headed on up to that class. I went and hung out with her. And uh, by the end of the school year, I got a message from her parents saying, we would like to invite you to our daughter's graduation as a family member. And they brought me to this graduation. I never met her parents before. They took me out for dinner. They told me how grateful they were that I was in this girl's life. That girl ended up going off to a college program to become an electrician. And now she's an electrical apprentice and she has become like family to me. She's part of the kick-ass team now. And this is just one of many stories. I've met a lot of the kick-ass ambassadors through this advocacy and they love it so much that they have now said, I want to pay it forward as well. And they've joined the team. So tell me about your Kick-Ass Careers team, your advisory board associates, ambassadors. Yeah. So basically I'm very much about pr promoting the trades as authentically and ethically as possible. So I vet the team. We have a team right now of 13 people. We don't have all their um, bios and stuff up. But basically what I say is if you want to pay it forward to the future and you want to be a speaker and you're willing to represent the trades with authenticity in an ethical way, then this is the team for you. It's a volunteer position on the team. I do help coach them if they want some speaking tips and tricks. I do introduce them to different um, educators and um, events that they can attend. I set them up with a lot of times I call like magazines and stuff and get them set up with articles and podcasts. And I just really want them to be the ambassadors of the future because I mean, I'm getting older. And I want to bring in a lot of young talent that wants okay, to go out. You're still a baby, so just <laughs> remember that. Well, a lot of people have heard my story now, and I think there's so many really cool, diverse stories out there. So I just want to find people that are going to represent the trades proudly and that want to go out into the schools and educate the next generation to come up. And I believe that the younger we go into the schools, we're changing that mindset of the future. Where can people find you? What all social media platforms are you on? Okay, absolutely. I'm all over social media. So I'm mostly, my personal one is made in the trades. That's my personal brand. Kick-Ass Careers is the team brand. So that's, it's, it's kind of like an, not speaking agency, but advocacy agency sort of thing. Um, so if you're looking for any ambassadors for the skilled trades, or you want some information about Kick-Ass Careers, it's kickasscareers.ca because I'm Canadian. Um, so you can jump on there, learn about our team, learn about some of our efforts. We're also on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, and then if you are looking to find me for corporate, then that's my madeinthetrade.com. So I am made in the trades. That's my logo, but the, 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 I couldn't get made in the trades. Whoever owns that, please contact me. Oh. Um, you know, so I'm made in the trade.com and that's where I have my corporate speaking engagements and an agent. How long have you been an iron worker now? 21 years. And before this, you were a bartender, which I was a bartender too. Have you really thought about the fact about how much your father working with you, teaching you to use tools, teaching you to do things right? has helped you throughout your whole career? Yes, absolutely. I think about that all the time. I did take a quick path as I, I worked in healthcare for a short amount of time. So I worked in a lot of nursing homes. I took a five month program through a community college that I went into as a mature student because I was a high school dropout. And my parents really at first wanted me to take my mom's career path in healthcare. And I worked in nursing homes. Now I'm going to tell you something. People say that women are not cut out to be in skilled trades. Working in those nursing homes was by far 
more difficult than any job in a skilled trades. And I don't care how heavy you say the labor is, the steel doesn't fight back the way people fight back. I've been bit and pushed and punched and you name it when you're working with people with different different disabilities. You know, I was working Mm -hmm. with Alzheimer's and dementia and people who get very violent. So if you can do healthcare and work in nursing homes, you can work in any industry, especially skilled trades. The morning that little Jamie McMillan walked in to be an apprentice iron worker. If you could go back to your house and stand outside the front door and talk to little Jamie when she came walking up, what would you tell her based on what you know now? I would walk up to my little self and say, Jamie, you have no idea the doors this is going to open up for your life. So get out there, do your best, learn not to take things personally and live your best life because, oh my goodness, the skilled trades have opened doors to opportunities that I never thought were possible. I went from a student in school that was in special education that got picked on and bullied with learning disabilities to becoming a skilled trades professional, owning my own company, becoming a professional speaker, winning all types of awards, being on the cover of magazines, and a couple of years ago getting appointed by my prime minister, Justin Trudeau, as one of three people that the federal government selected to be on a skilled trades advisory board to come up with a campaign for the government to promote skilled trades to youth as first choice pathways. Wow. Little me. I would have never thought that this could be a possibility, all because I ran into my high school enemy when she ran out of ink in her pen when she was trying to write down some information. Wow. Did you ever end up working with her? We did end up working together on a job and then she left. I don't even know where she is now. She left the industry. Um, I think she went to teaching, if I'm not mistaken. I think she teaches English as a second language. I've enjoyed getting to know you through social media, watching what you do, talking to you, reaching out, connecting. I mean, we've spent hours on the phone talking about the trades and kick-ass careers and how do we do this? How do we get more people into the trades? You're so passionate about the trades kids learning about the trades at an early age women in the trades and it shows in everything you do so thank you this has been fun and it has been such a pleasure to get to know you You too this is amazing and thank you so much for having me here i really appreciate this this is a great experience and you're a force raj you're a force thank you for what everything you do